you everyone. Um, thank you for coming uh, today. I think this is the first day of harvest where we have two keynote um, speeches. So I think uh, I want to thank Regita for making that happen. Uh, when the organizers were organizing um, data harvest, they did not know about the Panama Papers. It was a secret. Uh, and when we came out, uh, it was a great honor to uh, be invited to a conference to talk. Uh, probably there are many empty seats because you're already tired to, <laughs> to go to Panama Papers talk, um, talks in this uh, conference, so I'll try to make it different and hopefully I succeed. Um, I'm going to talk about the Panama Papers um, and I borrowed this sentence from uh, the source that leaked the Panama Papers. John Doe uh, made a manifesto several weeks ago saying that the revolution. So as you can see, everything started with a message from an anonymous source saying pretty much what I was saying, do you want data? Of course, if I ask you all here, do you want data, the answer would be not that obvious, right? It's not that obvious because John Doe not only reached Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany, also reached big media organizations around the globe that basically ignored that message for different reasons, I guess. Jodo reached out to WikiLeaks that basically didn't pay attention to his or her message. And those two guys did. And then that's how Panama Papers started. To me, they are among the cleverest, cleverest or the most clever people, uh, journalists I know, not only because they responded to the answer to, the, to that question, but also because they decided to not practice something that we've been doing in investigative journalism for a long time, which is I get something, I hold on to it because I want my name in the front page of my paper. I want to get credit. And this is why we're here, to break great stories. But they suddenly realized that what they had thought was 2.6 terabytes of data was too much for them. So instead of playing golem journalism and holding on to the ring, like he was the ring, Lord of the Rings, and because it's their precious and they're not going to share it with anybody. Instead of doing that, they thought, 
Maybe I can get some other people on board and we can share the responsibility of dealing with the biggest leak in journalism history. Because what they had in their hands was 11.5 million files of a Panamanian law firm, Mossack Fonseca. Probably you have not heard about this, or you have not heard about this before. It's one of the main law firms in the world that deals with the creation of companies offshore in tax havens, jurisdictions that sell two things. One, low taxes, two, secrecy. Therefore, I'm sure you've all had this situation where you're investigating something, somebody, then crosses the world, the issue crosses the world from Spain to Luxembourg, from Luxembourg to Ireland, from Ireland to the British Virgin Islands, and all of a sudden you're stuck. Because the British Virgin Islands doesn't tell you who is behind a company. So they knew that they had something very valuable in their hands, and that there were many, many connections around the world. Therefore, they decided to share it. They knew it was even too big for them. Sue Lloyd Society at the time, a year ago, did not have anybody that did data journalism. So when they started comparing and they saw, it's like, okay, these are the projects they had previously worked on. Most of them were previous leaks. And this is the Panama Papers. Easily you can see the scale, right? I'm sure that one of the first thoughts of Frederick and Baskin was, oh shit, how do we deal with this, right? Um, so basically, what they did is think, if this is connected to 200 countries, or more than 200 countries, I need to be on the global team. How did they do it? Well, we had collaborated with them at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. So they came to us. They had um, worked in previous investigations with us, and therefore they thought that we were a good outlet to come to with the data and to help them put up a global team put up a global team of trust, and use technology to help us tell a better story. So the ICIJ, I hope all of you know what, who we are and what we do, but let me just basically explain that we are a network of journalists, almost 200 journalists in more than 65 countries, that work together in stories, trying to use collaboration in investigative journalism in topics that are cross-border and try to investigate, investigate them all together by using local knowledge. So for example, if we need somebody, you know, in Belgium, instead of getting our journalists and parachute them into Brussels and then investigating Brussels, we actually contact the people in the network that work in Brussels or work elsewhere in Belgium and we work with them because they're the most knowledgeable people, right? So instead of doing parachuting journalism, which is what journalism has done for a long time and still does, uh, with you know not only for correspondents but people correspondents that are being sent out to cover topics, we actually gather the local knowledge to create global intelligence. So at the ICIJ, we gathered a big team. This time, the biggest team ever to collaborate in journalism. We oh sorry, just hold on. This is not the thing. Let me just the biggest team ever investigated journalism, and we gathered more than 370 reporters from more than 100 media organizations in almost 80 countries. I like to think of ourselves as the United Federation of Planets for those Star Trek fans here. I'm sure there are many. Um, because we are here in the enterprise at the ICIJ, we're a very small team, and we go planet and through planet, media through media, trying to get them to collaborate. So we knock on the door of the Guardian, we knock on the door of Lesoir, we knock on the door of Le Monde, we knock on the door of Fusion in the US, we knock on the door of non-profit media centers in, um, in, uh, you know, in Latin America, for example, and we get them to agree to put a team together with us. So we basically are doing investigative journalism in a distributed way with a distributed cost. So when we knock on the door of the Guardian, we tell the Guardian, hey, the journals that you put, you pay for them because you're already in the payroll. Le Monde, do the same. And that's how we built a team of more than 370 journalists because we distributed the cost. I like to think of ICIJ as the application to journalism of the distributed and collaborative economy. And this is the way we can build such a big collaboration. Uh, the previous slide that I just wanted to show, show you is, you know, I don't know if you knew about ICIJ before the Panama Papers, 
But let me remind you that you may remember us from, how did you remember the character from Simpson? The Simpsons that said, you may remember me from, well, you may remember us from previous investigations that also had an impact here in Europe that were connected to leaks and to offshore. Um, and there were offshore leaks, Luxembourg leaks, Swiss leaks. Previously, this is, we have done offshore investigations, investigations based on leaks. We also do other topics that are based on public sources. But I guess that it's very important to understand that this is our fourth investigation based on a big leak, based on a collaborative team. And to me, the Panama Papers is like the best baby of this past, the best baby of everything we've learned throughout these past years, in the past four years or so. So we built this big team, and don't you think, I mean, you may think that it was very easy to convince our editors to work on this, uh, and that partners had it easy, but the first question they had when they go, got to their editors and said, hey, the ICIJ has called me, Let's work together in this new investigation. We're going to dive into the offshore world. The first question always was, yeah, but having a company offshore is legal, right? Um, you know, it's true. Having a company in a tax haven, creating a company in Panama, in the British Virgin Islands, it's completely illegal. What's illegal is not to report it. It's not to report it to the tax authorities. In most countries, except some transparent Nordic countries, tax um, terms are not public. Therefore, us journalists don't know if something many times is illegal. So we were dealing with a legal topic. So is it a story? Well, that's a story because as Obama said after we published, a few days after we published, thank Obama for this quote, that is exactly the problem. The problem is that the offshore world is completely interconnected in today's economy, being used by the most powerful in a parallel way and affecting our global economy. It's affecting inequality. It's affecting our, you know, that we cannot fund public services. It's affecting the collection of taxes. So it's affecting us all. But even though we had done these investigations about tax havens before, I don't think we were able to show the world how important this is today's economy, and how much do you pay attention to the offshore world. So when we got this leak and we started looking into the Panama Papers, we realized that we had something big in our hands. We really had a treasure in our hands because we were going to be able to show really how the machine, the offshore machine works. And the way to do that for us is to work in secret uh, for a period of time, in this case a year, and then to publish all together so we can create the best way possible around the world. These are some of the front pages that happened on April 3rd, um, 2016, and when we published all together, Sunday night, 8 p.m. in Europe, everybody went out, front pages, online reactions, Edward Snowden tweeting, and making this a big topic from the fir very first moment, trending topic of Twitter for days. I'm sure you have heard about the Panama Papers because there was such a global reaction. And I'm not here to talk to you about what we discovered because you basically can read about it and I'm sure you already know about it. However, let me remind you about the main highlights of what we discovered from a global perspective. In every country, then, there were names of famous people, um, names of people in the public interest, like in my country, Spain. Uh, I live in Madrid. Spain, the best country in the world, by the way. Uh, this is a fact. Uh, so in Spain, uh, in Spain, we had big names from Almodovar, the film director, to the uh, sister of the former king of Spain, to a minister that actually had to resign after we published his connections to the offshore world. But from the global perspective, the main findings were that we were able to show how the system works and how offshore is intricated in every side of society for the powerful, of course. So we showed how there were politicians in the data. More than 140 politicians were connected to this specific leak which was the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. Remember, just one company that operates out of Panama, also in dozens of countries in the world, but it's just one company that does this. 
There are thousands of companies that does this, do the same that Mosa Fonseca. So we had 140 politicians in more than 50 countries. We had celebrities. We had tax evaders. We had fraudsters. We had, for example, 33 companies that were blacklisted by the US government that were doing, actively doing business with Mossack Fonseca. We also had billionaires, of course. The rich people go offshore. We had 29 billionaires from Forbes top 500 richest in the world. And we were able to show how they did it. And in order to show it, for example, we built this interactive that show who were the power players, who were the politicians in the data. And you can see some of the names that you may recognize because there were 12 current and former world leaders. Some, like the Prime Minister of Iceland, had not told about their offshore connections and resigned after our revelations. We also showed how the system worked, who were the enablers, and there was a session about this yesterday. We showed how the banks were among the main enablers of the system. This happens not in Panama, not in the British Virgin Islands. It ha this happens in our cities. This happens in London, in Madrid, in Brussels, in Paris. It's there, the intermediary is there that help clients from our countries use the offshore world. So banks were among the biggest players. Uh, we, through data analysis, we found more than 500 banks had requested Mossack Fonseca, the creation of more than 15,000 companies in tax havens, with a clear pattern, by the way. If one looked at the graph and the graphic of how this went, there was a big spike towards 2005, the market plateaus, it goes down in 2010. Basic explanation. Why? There's implementation of European Savings Directive that goes into place 2005 and that basically asks banks to withhold tax to foreign, um, foreign residents that are European citizens. Therefore, the request of offshore companies goes up. Why? Because the European Savings Directive had a loophole that basically said, hmm, I need to withhold tax if you're a person, but if you're a company, I don't. So we actually have notes in these and in the previous investigation, for example, showing how HSBC was advising their clients to use offshore structures to not have to apply the European Savings Directive. So it goes up, big spike, big use of offshore companies, then the US starts clamping down on uh, residents that are having bank accounts abroad, especially in Switzerland, the UBS case, et cetera, request goes down. So we were able to show through data how the system worked, again, in this very small piece of the puzzle, the world of Mossack Fonseca, one in thousands. And then we had partners that did great work. You have seen Helena Benston in many of the talks, uh, and she talked about this yesterday. Uh, they did a great analysis in The Guardian to see how, who were the owners of properties that we didn't know before. We didn't know who were the owners of properties in the name of companies that were incorporated in tax havens. And thanks to the Panama Papers data, they were able to unveil some of that secrecy and reveal who were the owners of those properties. By the way, right now there's a big conversation in the UK about how the property registry should be more, be more transparent. So there are a lot of ramifications of what we've done. And of course, people, as we published, went to the streets. These are the streets of Iceland. Before the Prime Minister resigned, they were completely outraged about the fact that they had trusted their government. The government that you know came out of you know the bank banking problem that they had, and they trusted them. They thought they were clean, and then they were not open and transparent with their business. So there was public outrage, and right now we're just starting to see the policy changes. There's new conversation about the offshore world, for example, about how beneficial owners should be recorded in our corporate registries, how corporate registries from tax havens should be public how companies and corporations should report country by country what their subsidiaries are doing and disclose the money flows, which is the trick. We're about just starting to see the reactions. I hope we all get to put pressure on our governments and, uh, and the politicians so that they keep 
working on the promises that they made. But to me, one of the biggest um, satisfactions is to hear from the people that are fighting, uh, you know, and advocating for this, that the Panama Papers has been the biggest change for them in advocating for corporate transparency. But I have to say, as I was saying, I'm not here to talk about the Panama Papers. Sorry to deceive you. I think you had too many talks about the Panama Papers, and it made me think, what can I talk about? Um, not to sound repetitive. And how can I be of use to all of you? How can I be of use to all these investigative journalists, and journalists that are attending Data Harvest, that love data, and that want to create these networks and these collaborations to do better investigative journalism? And instead of talking about the Panama Papers, I want to talk about the lessons that we learned over these, over these four years working with Peaks and working with the offshore world, and basically building the biggest collaborative teams ever in journalism history. To me, when I sat down to think, I was, okay, what are the trends I'm seeing here? And I saw three trends. One, electronic leaks are the new normal. We're no longer in the Pentagon Papers here where we have boxes, you know? And somebody said that if we have to print all the Panama Papers documents, there will have to be trucks going through Europe uh, to actually put them in, you know, in, in underground and, and study them in newsrooms. The second thing that I think is coming to me as a trend is global collaboration is the only way to deal with these big electronic leaks and investigative journalism in this global world. And the third one is that data journalism is here to stay. I remember when I started doing journalism, um, data journalism around six or seven years ago, that I was being told, ah, data journalism, this is the new time. You know, it's like community managers. Remember the boom of community managers? Data journalists, this is like the new high. And whoever said that was wrong. And you here know they were wrong, and that's probably why you're here. So yesterday, in the, cover in the presentation, um, when we were talking about the tennis match, match fixing, I saw Ryan Gosling, and he made me realize what I had to do in this presentation. <laughs> yes, Rikite only allowed me to do a keynote speech if I showed Brian Bosley. Um, so I am here to tell you about the methodology we've been applying at ICIJ for all these um, investigations, Panama Papers and the previous ones. Um, we've been building knowledge and I, I want to share with you so you guys get to do great investigations collaboratively in the year to come so that next year I can sit there and can sit here and I can get to learn how I can do better collaborative investigations too. And we can get to build better investigative journalism together. So in the era of uh, viral content, I've structured this in 10 points. So these are my 10 tips uh, to do collaborative investigative journalism. Tip number one, you have to have a great team. May be obvious, but it's been a while for me to realize that you need to have not just the best professional team, but the best personal team. And I'm very proud to say that at the small startup that I work for, that is called ICIJ, we have a great team that is great professionals and great people. So why do I call ICIJ startup? I call ICIJ startup because you may think of us like we're big, when we're actually not. We have 12 people on staff, and these are the 12 people on staff. Our leaders, the director and the deputy director, based out of Washington, although one is Irish and the other one is Argentinian. We have three people based out of the US, uh, one online editor, one person for a web, one. Uh, we also have an editor and a reporter, all based in, in the US. Uh, there, two of them are, based, are American, one is from Australia. We also have the data team. Uh, the data team is, as you can see, based with two legs, one in Latin America, in Costa Rica, Venezuela, and the other leg is in Europe. Uh, we have a big presence in Europe through the people that you can see there. You've met Cecile, she's based out of Paris, she's here. Cecile, where is Cecile? Cecile, that's Cecile. Uh, you've met Matthew, uh, Matthew, he's based in Berlin, he's there too. 
And then we also have Miguel, who works out of Madrid, Spain. I work out of Madrid, Spain. And we have legs in different continents. And then we also have Will, um, who works out of Washington but travels a lot to Africa. It's great that he speaks French greatly and that he speaks good English. And uh, he's a great Africa champion and works with partners in Africa. So ICIJ, we are small. Our budget, annual budget, is $1.8 million. And not only we're small, but you know, and we are small in, in, in terms of, 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 of money, uh, but also we're no longer an American organization. I've, I've heard people tell me, yeah, I see a day you are the Americans. We're not. Um, so basically, I don't think we have the best team, but the second tip is have a great data team. And this is my great data team. As you can see, I'm not the person doing graphics in <laughs> my team. Uh, this is my effort to try to show you uh, how my team works. Uh, basically, we work on different areas, but I would say we do three main things. One is data journalism, data analysis, data reporting. We improve and create stories, and we tell stories through data. We also tell stories in a visual way, so we also do data visualization, and we also create tools for journalists to collaborate, because we have this dual role at the ICIJ where on one hand we're a media organization and we publish our stories, but on the other hand we need to help the reporters that work with us. So we are also service service, or we provide service, and I would say that many of the journalists here, and there are many that have worked in the Panama Papers, are quote unquote our clients. Let me remind you that clients is just clients based on this in-kind exchange of we all work together with the power that we have, which is us journalists. So basically, we mainly work on projects, but we also work on tech. You see here a program in France that I didn't show you before. Uh, basically, uh, Julian doesn't have a photo anywhere in the internet. Uh, maybe Paul Myers can find me one from Julian. Uh, but we have one program, for example, that is based just develop technology, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. So, not only have a great team, first, you're a small team, also have a great data team. You're seeing this here, two years ago, this did not exist. The ICIJ built its first data team around two and a half years ago now, and I remember when I was you know, constantly telling my bosses we need to build a team, we need to build a team, we need programmers in our team, and they were like, hmm, but are we gonna have enough tasks? for a programmer, and I said, yeah, I, th I, think, I think we can build a team with people from other skills. I remember when we brought Matthew and Rigo uh, on board, in the end we got two programmers, I think uh, maybe it was too persistent. <laughs> and basically, within months, my bosses were telling me, hmm, we may have to get a new programmer to work in the team, or a new data, like programmer for them is data specialist, right? And now, two and a half years later, we are six to seven people. So. We're pretty new, and I'm very happy, both with my team, the ICG team, but also with you know, the data team. As I was saying, one of the lessons that I've learned, and I think we've all learned at the ICIJ and the media partners, is that there are a lot of benefits to working globally, so I would recommend you to work globally as much as you can, because the world works in a global way. This is just an example of a network of organized crime. It's, you know, this is how it works. If organized crime works this way, I think journalism should work this way. And, you know, this is just an example of um, Mossack Fonseca's um, network done by our partners at Fusion in the US. It's interactive, by the way, so if you have a presentation in your laptops, you can click and explore. Um, it's a network, right? So that's one more example of why we need to work um, in networks. And the ICIJ, as I was saying at the beginning, we're a network. You don't see the map, but you can clearly see the continents because we have people in many, many parts of the world, pretty much in, in, you know, in, in many of the countries in the world, as I was saying, more than 65 countries. And not only we have journalists all over the place, but also we've done this since 1997. Uh, ICIJ was created by Chuck Lewis in 1997, and this network of journalists that trust each other has been building since then. One of the first questions I normally get asked when I talk about the Panama Papers is, how did you guys keep a secret for such a long time? Well, we've been building trust since 1997. So, 
How do we build trust? We, we build trust in many ways, uh, and but our best way to develop trust and to get journalists to want to work together is to work together on projects. And on projects, uh, once we knock on doors of these, all these media organizations or all these journalists in the network of AICIJ, what we uh, do is to try to get them in the same online space to collaborate. So we've uh, implemented an open source tool called Oxwell that we've improved uh, with our development team. And this is basically where the communication in the ICIJ projects happened. This is where the communication in the Panama Papers project happened. We call it the Global iHub. It's basically a social networking tool. Uh, so basically you can see it has a wall, like Facebook, the newsfeed. Uh, you can also have threaded communications in forums. You can also share links, you can also share files. And as I was saying, all this is based on open source software. Um, and we've implemented some security features, for example, we've added two-step authentication so that when reporters had to log in, they not only relied on their memories and the past phrase that they remembered in their, in their heads, um, hopefully not stored in their computers, and also in their cell phones, there was an auto-generated code every 30 seconds that they needed to enter every time to log in. So hopefully that mitigates the risk of uh, impersonation and, and hacking into the platform. So for us, it was very important to, once we form a team, keep developing this trust. It's not that trust is developed like, hey, we're working together. Great, we trust each other. I think that this is like in any relationship, you know, you start with your boyfriend and you don't trust him all that much at the beginning. You don't know if he's getting with other girls, right? So you need to be wary at the beginning, and then there's a point where, you know, you get to trust him through day by day, right? Well, this is the same thing. So even though we all signed an agreement at the beginning saying, we're gonna respect the deadline, we're gonna keep the material embargoed, I will share with others. We have to keep fostering, right? So a lot of the role of ICIJ is be there as, a, I would say two leaders trying to tell the team, or better as coaches, trying to tell the team, hey, you can do it, why don't you work with this, why don't you handle it here, and try to get the best team possible to get them to share, right? So this online space has been great. I encourage you to think of online spaces where you can share this 5D and across borders. And I think that physical meetings are also important, or virtual meetings if you can. Um, and physical meetings we found very useful. We met four times in this project. Not all of the reporters met for those four, uh, four meetings, but we met in Washington, in Munich. We did a regional meeting in Johannesburg for African journalists. And we also did a meeting only to talk about Russia in London in December last year. And to get a great team of collaborators, you really need to start choosing your partners wisely. And I think that Marina Walker did the keynote speech here, the deputy director of the SCIJ, and she talked a lot about a methodology, but I just wanted to remind you how I think we made this happen. I think it's through trust. And I like to compare this to doing trapeze. I don't know if you've done trapeze. This is me doing trapeze. Uh, this is also my excuse of showing you a great catch in trapeze. Uh, but, uh, but basically, trapeze is this great uh, activity. Or there's a moment where you're hanging from a trapeze over here and you have to let yourself go because somebody else has told you that he or she will catch you from this other end. And there's a moment where you're just there with your hands hoping that you're going to throw yourself into the air, you have guides, so it's not that bad, you're not going to die, and that somebody in the air is going to catch you. There's a leap of faith there, you just have to jump hoping that the person will be in response. And there's this beautiful moment where you're starting to see some hands coming to you, and that person catches you, and takes you to the other end. And that's a great catch, right? And I think that that's what we do when we collaborate together, which is there has to be a moment where there's a leap of faith, when you're like, I'm just gonna jump. I hope that person catches me. <laughs> um, but, you know, and when it happens, it's great, right? So there has to be a leap of faith, there has to be trust, trust that needs to be built over time, and that's basically the key of the Panama Papers, the key of all the collaborations that you can see at ICIJ or other networks, is that we are human beings believing in other human beings. And here at ICIJ, we work with 
organizations from all over the globe. This is just the first nine organizations you get when you look at our media partners. And I thought it was a great representation of just by getting the first nine organizations organized by alphabetical order, <laughs> uh, you can get to see big media organizations like ABC in Australia, like Afton Post in Norway. You also see small media organizations in their countries. You also, that some of you may not have, have heard about some of the people or some of the organizations here. And you also see networks of investigative journalists like Ankir. Ankir is a network of centers that do investigative reporting. So we work from a range of media organizations that are from small nonprofits to small media organizations to big media organizations. Um, and I think that that's very enriching uh, because we get to learn from each other. And as I was saying, people ask me, or ask us, how do you keep this a secret, really? Like, we journalists like gossip a lot. How do you keep this a secret for a year? And I think that the best way to define this is this. I think we kept it a secret because we felt we were all in this together for a greater cause, and that we were a team. I remember a Swedish colleague was telling me, you did not want to be the weakest link. <laughs> because we felt like we were part of a family. And I think that this Musketeers uh, photo be best represents who we were and the team we built. So back to my tips, I would say that if you have to deal with a leak that is big, and big is changing. Um, three years ago, big was 260 gigabytes. Um, today, in 2016, big is 2.6 terabytes. Hopefully, in data harvest next year, big will be way more, um, hopefully. Uh, but basically, I think that one lesson we've learned over the leaks that we've worked on that have grown is that we need to spend time looking at the data. When we started working in offshore leaks three, almost four years ago, we had in front of us a hard drive of 260 gigabytes. And each partner had a copy. And they hired me, well, I was working with ICIJ, but they assigned me to do research for the rest of the world. So my task was to sit down in front of my computer all day and search in the, in the hard drive and make packages to send to Pakistan, make packages to send to Spain, make packages to send to Chile. And obviously it became clear to me that, you know, I was never gonna make it. I think it took me like a week and a half to say, you know, I cannot do this. There are too many journalists around the world. And of course I'm not scalable, why is scalable technology? So it's then that we started thinking, you know, that you know we need to use technology. But it's there and through the other investigations that we've done that we realized that back then we could have done something better, which is we could have just not get reporters into the data without knowing what we had. We needed to get data specialists to look at the data to know what we really have. So this time around in the Panama Papers, we actually spent several months with just the data team, looking at the data and analyzing what we had in front of us. And I guess the first question or the main question that you need to answer is, what is inside the 2.6 terabytes? And what are the file types that we have? And how can this be processed? Because this is basically this, this breakdown, is basically what led the organization of the rest of the project. Because as you can see, we're seeing a lot of emails there. So we need to be able to read emails and read attachments. Inside the attachments, we need to be able to look at communications, so, you know, several chains of emails. We are seeing the, the, their database formats or database files. And we are seeing their, oh no, PDFs and images. Uh, I think when I saw this and Matthew told me how many PDFs and images we had, I think I would call it crying. Thinking, oh my God, this is going to take forever because you know we have to process it and we have to set up a whole army of servers in the cloud uh, to actually process these images fast. And we're going to talk more about our stack and the technology we use behind the Panama Papers uh, later at 3:15 in this same room. So I'll you know tease you and I'll, I'll, I'll let you um, come to that meeting or that session. But this was what led the investigation and what led how we organized the, the team, right? So don't forget to look at the files. And that may take months. Um, push, push, push your boss to try to give you that time. It took me four projects to get my boss to give, me, give me my, that time. But luckily, uh, in this, this time around, um, 
they understood that we needed to have time to look at the data. <laughs> Did I jump from five to seven? Oh, there, there are <laughs> great data, <laughs> data journalists. Um, so, tip number six, seven. Um, I think that we learned something uh, that is uh, to, do, to do something we call radical sharing. And I think that that's our best methodology, the radical sharing. Radical sharing means that if we have access to 2.6 terabytes of data, everybody has access to 2.6 terabytes of data. But since we're all in this together, trying to mine this together, we believe that it's better that we all access it getting to build on the technology that we have to. So for example, we elaborated and worked on open source technology, Apache Solar for the indexing of the files, and Project Blacklight as a user interface. And this is how our document search platform worked. As I told you, we work with small, media organizations, we work with non-profit centers that don't have data teams. So being able to create technology to get them work, despite not having a technical team to mine those documents is key. And you know, I actually feel very proud when I get hear from members that thanks to these tools, they've been able to do great work. Um, they were like, oh, this is great. I hope my IT team was like this. Uh, because of course, you all know about the relationships with the IT teams in your, uh, in your newsrooms, right? Uh, so basically, um, we built platforms that help us do projects, not just to communicate, but also to share documents, like in this case. And you can search, for example, Joaquin Loera. And you can not only search Joaquin Loera, you can search Joaquin Loera Proximity 2. So you can search Joaquin something Loera, and thanks to that, you end up finding documents connected to this man that uh, you may all know, El Chapo Guzman, one of the most wanted tra traffickers in the world that was arrested uh, a few uh, months ago, um, thanks to or in parallel to Champagne uh, interviewing him. So another one of the tips that is connected to this is not only you have to spend time looking at the data, I encourage you to share anything we have, you have, all the data you have. Also, try to think cleverly about how technology can allow you to be a better journalist. In our case, for example, when we looked at the files, we were clear that there was some structured format inside the files. And unfortunately, it was not in a database, it was not in SQL, it was not in Access, it was not in any other format, it was a deconstructed database, that's why you see three million records. So we had to use computer programming to reconstruct this database and basically have a hard SQL database. But maybe if this database is about companies and the people behind those companies and the addresses connected to those companies and the intermediaries that make them happen, maybe a SQL database is not the best way to explore it, right? So, Thanks to open source technology that allowed us to extract, transform, and load this SQL database, we transform it into a graph database. And we used Linkurius to actually um, show the data in a visual format. And reporters just had to click on dots. You know, they just had to double click on a dot, and then they got the connections. And more advanced reporters could actually write SQL queries to get to know what are all the connections of this person? Are this person and this person connected? What is the shortest path? And thanks to being able to show the data in a visual way, reporters actually found more connections and they found more people to investigate. I remember Mila Nuss, I don't know if she's here there, she, uh, from Finland, she works at YLE. She met me once and she said, Bar, I found four more Finnish people. Uh, because there's a function that is fuzzy matching, and of course all Finnish are called the same. So she found <laughs> she found more people with Finnish-like names that ended up being people connected to Finland. So technology helped Mila do better stories in Finland and feel a bit like a super woman um, going through the universe. I would say that. Collaboration is, I guess, my main message. Chuck Lewis wrote a piece in The Guardian called Collaboration, Collaboration, Collaboration is the future of journalism. So one of the things has to be share. But not only share what you're reporting, not only share all your tips, not only share what you found so that you can build on it, uh, also share what you produce. 
So we research, we um, share research, we share our copy, our text, texts. ICIJ, for example, um, writes several global stories that shares with partners more than a week in advance so that they can translate it. We share it with footnotes. So we share it after it's gone through editing, fact-checking, and legal process. So, and with the footnotes so that our partners can reproduce our research. Uh, we share figures, we do main figures about, we found 214,000 companies connected to 21 tax havens, etc., etc. But you can also share even more. In this occasion at the ICIJ, we've experimented with sharing interactives, sharing products that are not just text, but are, you know, interactive and that get a lot, a lot of traffic and a lot of um, interaction with the readers. So this is one of the examples. We did this um, interactive graphic, as I was explaining before, showing the, um, showing the uh, power players. You could also show, see the connections. This is the former Prime Minister of Iceland. It was done in a technical way where our partners, this is El Confidencial's version, could tweak the theme and adapt it to their needs. And it was done multilingual. So it was work done in four languages so that you know, um, reporters could embed it in different parts of the world. And we also did other products testing how technical collaboration would work. So Cecile worked with Le Monde team. I think Jeremy is also around here. Um, and uh, I think he's in the back, so you cannot see his hand. Uh, and basically, the tech team of Le Monde, or the, Le the data team of Le Monde, worked with Cecile, uh, who did the research and the text, and they did the JavaScript. And we built this great game where you can get to hide your money. Uh, and play like a football player or a politician or a business executive and go like choose your own adventure and sometimes you win um, and sometimes you lose. So all this was material done by ICIJ or ICIJ in conjunction with the media partners. Media partners also produced material that they shared. The Swiss did a great video, animated video about Russia and Putin's connections to the data or the close circle of Putin and they shared it. Um, so we get to share also interactive and you know, graphics and animated videos. So not only think of sharing on research and copy, think on beyond that. And I say, I guess that we didn't want to just keep the panel of papers for a team of journalists. We wanted to give power to the people somehow. And we realized that even though we couldn't publish the 11.5 million files, we actually could publish this structured data. We could publish this corporate registry data that should be public, but it's not, because tax savings produce secrecy. And in May 9th, uh, just a few weeks back, we, we republished the offshore DIX database. It was existing since 2013 uh, with uh, a previous leak, the offshore DIX data. We now added more than 200,000 companies uh, connected to the Panama Papers data. Anybody could go in and find stories. This is a story that the Times of London found. Uh, Emma Watson, the actress of the Harry Potter, was in the data, and uh, her flat in London was owned by an offshore company. So thanks to that, we're helping not just do great journalism, but also break the secrecy of tax havens and put this conversation into the policy world so that they can think about it. I don't want to leave, and I know I'm running out of time already, uh, and I want to get some questions in. I don't want to leave with, without giving a bonus, which my bonus is number 10 now. <laughs> Tip number 10 is that I think that despite um, everything we've accomplished so far, um, with these big investigations we've accomplished, everything we've accomplished so far with um, the Panama Papers, we need to be prepared for new challenges. And we're already facing new challenges. And I want to leave you with two of the big challenges that I think are the challenges that I know already that we need to be prepared for, and that I'm looking forward to seeing how they get solved and to talk about them in Data Harvest 2017. The first is, how can we get to collaborate on collections of documents? So right now we've got journalists working on the Panama Papers, but we didn't quite have an answer for how can we get the Panama Papers collection of documents talk to all the cassettes that they had in Argentina, all the documents that they have in the media, in their archive. 
all the documents that another partner has. We haven't quite solved that question, right? Because we're different media organizations responding to different editors, different bosses, different traditions. How do we deal with that? And also at the ICIJ level is, how do we get the computers and the data of the computers of the ICIJ network to talk to each other so that I know if Brigitte has a document that might be of interest to me because she has a Spanish connection that she doesn't care about or she doesn't even know that it's there, but might be relevant for me in Spain. So at ICIJ, we're doing a project, we're calling it Data Share, where Julian, that guy that doesn't want to show his face, is working. And basically, we're trying to solve this question from a technological perspective. Is there software that we can build based on open source software, if it's possible, where our computers can get to talk to each other without having to share the raw documents? And I guess the other question is, how can we evolve? We've already done big collaborations, what is the evolution to that? To me, the evolution to that is how can networks of investigative journals get to work together so that we can build on each other's knowledge and not compete for the same arena? How can we get to share knowledge so that we are all doing better investigative journalism and not working based on our egos? And I think that with that, I want to end or maybe not, maybe we're here in one year to actually talk about the next big leak in investigative journalism, or better, the next big investigation in collaborative journalism and investigative journalism done on collection of public data. Thank you. So I guess that 
if you don't, I mean, probably the Guardian thinks um, their competitor is the New York Times, so maybe having the Guardian and the New York Times in the same project would be complicated. Maybe not. They are now working in the same project. The New York Times joined their projects recently. But I think that if you define competition in a country level, that's what has allowed us to do this. However, I think that there are new challenges happening of like, there are different networks of investigative journalists that have the same partners. And I would say that the best way to deal with this is to avoid conflict of interest. And if there's a conflict of interest on the same topic or topics that have crossover, for example, those need to be dealt with publicly and openly. I mean, publicly in a private setting, but they have to be dealt with openly. But we're still to see uh, whether uh, you know that's possible and how would that happen. And I, so that's why I think the challenge is between networks and that deal with same partners that work in several networks. I think that's more different, different than within country. I don't think there's a problem right now if you limit it. Great. Well, thank you very much.